Welcome, everyone, to episode 282 of Just Joshing. I'm your host, Joshua Pantelaresco. I write stuff in podcast two today. The amazing Kate Hartfield came on my show. She was a pleasant surprise. Um, Kate pushed me for a better interview. I really feel the second half of this interview in particular is really strong. Um, the first half is still fun. Um, definitely, definitely. Uh, Kate's an amazing writer, and I love her ideas on medieval fantasy. I love that we, you know the period she's talking about, and it was a lot of fun chatting with her. So, Kate, thanks for coming on my show. It was a, it was a ton of fun. Uh, I'm kind of in this like last minute mode here for when words collide. Um, tomorrow is when I officially uh, civilize myself for the show, um, getting some last minute stuff prepared. This one's kind of a neat. Um, weekend for me i always love the show it's been a very good show for me and a lot of good things have happened sometimes in spite of myself uh but yeah i'm looking forward to this one in particular saying hello and goodbye to a lot of people uh because i go into full move mode once this weekend's done but this week is also kind of special like i said wizard killer ebook is getting given away as well as you know go buy your leave the unquiet chattel jennifer one's quick initiation it's the last one of those i'm giving away here um yeah like i said really cool stuff coming up on the pod on the pod but when words collide is up and i'm excited about that but before we get to that let's get to our sponsors and let's then let's get to the interview just joshing is sponsored by indie imprint indie imprint brings your creations to life they believe in indies helping indies and they have been known to, to contribute to everything from game jams to nanorimo and everything in between. As a creator, you just bring your work to them, whether you're a writer, you're a musician, or video game designer, or whatever the case may be, and they will help you format, proof, and distribute your project to a variety of different avenues. For more information, check them out at info at indieimprint.com. And by Jennifer Ron, author. Jennifer is re-releasing her fantasy series Legend of Tenlock with her first book, Wicked Initiations, coming at When Words Collide. Uh, she's also been released to Dark Hoarder, courtesy of Bundarin Press. Uh, you can contact her at longativitythesis.ca. That is worldwideweb.longativitythesis.ca. So, the recorder is officially turned on. So if there's anything incriminating you'd like to mention, make it good. Uh, I'll try to think of something. Are you going to try to think of something? Yeah. That sounds like a very clever way to plead the fifth, but that's okay. I, I can handle that. <laughs> How are you doing today? I'm doing great, thanks. Yeah. yeah. It's a beautiful day here in Ottawa and nice and sunny. Yeah, well, we, we just finally got to our sun again. We had a week of rain, so mm. so if it heads your way, don't blame us. All right. All right. Or, or you can blame us. Just don't blame me specifically because I have nothing to do with it. I'm innocent. Well, you know, that kind of thing. So, like I said, so I guess what we'll start with you is, so have you always wanted to write? Or have you, there's just something you stumbled into? How did you get into the writing process? Yeah, I was uh, one of those kids who was always writing stories, even at a young age. Um so, yeah, I think I started my first uh, unfinished secondary world fantasy novel back when I was 10 or 11 or something on my dad's Osborne computer, which was one of those with the green monochromatic screen about three inches wide, you know, and it was on a floppy disk. Um, but I never finished that one. But I had, I kept writing, I wrote a few different novels throughout my 20s, and it just took me a while, you know, my apprenticeship was pretty long, I think, as a writer to it took me a while to kind of find what kind of writer I was and uh, to get good enough, uh, you know, to, to actually get out there and get published. So I'm in my 40s now, my early 40s, and uh, it took me a while, uh, but I've always been a writer all these years. I've always had something on the go. I took some years off in my early 20s uh, for grad school and as I was getting established as a journalist, but most of the time I've always written. So... Oh, so we, we can go this in a number of different ways. I think, um, so I'm going to ask, do you, since you've done journalism, do you prefer fiction or nonfiction? Like, do you prefer the, the interview part? Do you do, like, features? Do you do, like, investigative stuff? Uh, 
I did mainly opinion. Uh, so I was a journalist at the Ottawa Citizen for about, uh, well, 11 years full time and then on contract for a few years before that. Um, and most of that time I was working on opinion, but I also would moonlight for the book review section and, and do some features and, and that kind of thing. And I did some freelancing uh, in journalism before and after that. Uh, and I really enjoyed it. It was, uh, um, you know, a wonderful career and a passion and I loved being in the, uh, and I still teach journalism at Carleton University. So it's still a big part of my life. Uh, but I feel like that chapter is closed, uh, mostly for me now that I, I feel like I did that. And, uh, I always wanted to write fiction and that was always where my heart was. Uh, so now I'm moving more into writing more fiction and I just do nonfiction once in a while to kind of keep my skills up. Okay, so all right then. I I go this. I I'm I'm just about. I'm handing in my last draft to my editor. I'm publishing my first novel. I've done a couple books of poetry that were also fiction. Uh, but the thing that I I found for me that the real hard part about doing this was figuring out my voice and more specifically how to access my voice. Um, because we all have good ideas, but let's be honest, right? Um. All our idea, the concepts we come up with, have been done before in some form or another. What mm-hmm. makes the stories great is what you yourself bring into them, in my opinion. Um, yes. and, and so, where was that? Aha! I got this. I clicked moment because I can tell you where it was for me. But what was it for you? Um, I think honestly, it was when I started writing fantasy uh, and science fiction. Um, but the, in the first case, it was a fantasy novel, and I had written a couple of uh, literary, you know, for lack of a better word, um, contemporary fiction novels before that, that will live forever in my trunk if they're even still there. Uh, and uh, it just, it wasn't the kind of writer that I was supposed to be, I think. And uh, it was when I kind of gave myself permission to write the kind of books that I love to read that... Uh, I started to come into my own as a writer, I think. So that was around 2007 when I wrote, I started writing a fantasy novel. And uh, that one is also in the trunk, but it was a beginning. I think it was in a uh, in a mode that was allowing me to draw on my imagination and tell the kind of stories that I wanted to tell. So what was it for you? So for me, so there's, there's one big scene. I, 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 uh, I accidentally wrote an epic poem. Uh, yeah. So, uh, yeah, so... But there's this one particular chapter, and it, and it hit me at that point, like where this needed to go. Um, so my main character had just killed his uh, his uh, dragon master, and he was alone in the wilderness for the first uh, time on his own. And uh, I recognized, like, this is when you're on your own for your for, like very first time. It's a memorable experience where you're not, you don't have anyone that's necessarily going to be there for you. You don't have anyone. That, I mean, you don't. You're not you're on your own you have to figure things out on your own and you're alone and it was kind of long his dark nights like i'm tapping into that part of myself that i remember that first time i was on my own which was as a teenager um where i was the first time i was on my own and i remember what i felt like at that point it's like he would probably feel something similar to this what did that feel like and then it clicked it's like that's what was missing in my book a cerebrally like from a cerebral level, the con- my concepts were solid, but it, my my voice was not strong enough because at that point it was I wasn't letting myself come out of that shell, whatever that shell was. Um, so once I realized that, um, right, it's like okay, I made that one work. My current novel is about coming out of my comfort zone. As much as it is about unicorns that fart rainbows, as much as it has zombie mobsters, as much as it has um, it's a homage to my favorite stuff in video games and, and some of the science fiction ideas of the future. For me, it's about the fact that ultimately this is about a char- an individual who woke up one day and realized that his life is not quite what he wanted it to be and he needs to make some changes. And that's like people, that's the stuff people I think really connect to. I could be wrong on that, but I feel that's where I got, if I'm not good, at least confident. Does that make sense? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, yeah, and I think that um, you know it's kind of a paradox. But when you when you get to a, a place where you can really just do what you want to do, 
with your art um that seems to be where it connects with other people as well you know so i the book that ended up being my first published novel armed under fashion is kind of a bonkers very weird medieval fantasy and i was in a frame of mind when i wrote it where i had signed with an agent but we hadn't sold a book yet and I was just kind of feeling like, you know, it seems like no matter what I do, I, I can't break into this industry. So I'm just going to kind of write the book that I want to write. I'm going to make it as weird as I want it to be. And it's going to be the kind of book that I wish was on my shelf. And lo and behold, um, that turned into my first published novel. And um, I think, you know, you, you have to temper that somewhat. You can't just, you know, um, do whatever you want and not think about the reader. But I think having that, that honesty and just you know taking off the taking off the jackals in a way and just doing what you want to do can really help you to connect with other people well i i I think okay there's a business end to this like okay so my 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 first novel was an independent publisher so i'm letting myself this is the novel i'm letting myself completely play in right i don't care if it ever gets into a like a big publisher or not this is me going you know what this is me having fun and I think yep. I think if you read it, you're gonna have fun too. But if you don't, that's cool. This is my, but the, the this is I need this so I can do something a little bit more formulaic because I'm giving myself permission here to be completely unshackled, right? Yeah. And whereas if I was writing for the Big Five, which I do have a novel I'm working on for the Big Five, yeah. I still it's the balance is I recognize that they're buying it. They're the, in one sense, they're the client, and as a result, they're going to want certain things in their book. Now, I don't pretend to know every single thing they want because I know the industry changes all the time. But what I can do is I can make myself okay. What are the parts that I feel need to be here to make this click? Yeah. Right. Those are the parts I will I will fall on my sword on. Right. Um. But there are other parts where I'm like, no, this doesn't need to be here necessarily. I'm enjoying it. But if the client goes, well, could we, or can we expand this? Can we shrink this? Can we do this? So, sure. You know what? Whatever. You're paying. You're paying the bills, right? Yeah. Right. I think. I think. I think it all depends on your goals. But it also depends upon, like, again, like, I think. I think the best. I think the word we're looking for is authenticity. Mm-hmm. Right. And and. I think with with authenticity, um, people just know when you're into it, like when it's yours, like when you when you believe in it yourself. Even if it's not necessarily their cup of tea, on a subconscious level, they'll respect that, right? Yeah. Right. That's what I feel. But if you're trying to fake it, like um, I really, really don't like. Um, I'm getting more and more away. I love science fiction and fantasy, but I'm getting more and more away from the formula stuff. Mm-hmm. Right now, I'm reading Jade City by Fonda Lee. It's a fantastic book. Oh, I love that book so much. Yeah, it, it's fantastic. I love her take on like on a fantasy world. It's so interesting. It's got a Gangs of New York feel to it that feels really, really fun. But it's also, but it's also, it's so different than anything I've read in fantasy. Right? It yeah. almost, it's almost. You almost, she could have made this on, like, almost, if she took away the jade, a historical. It's such an interesting concept she did there. Um, I look at Brandon Sanderson. I love his, like, he's a systems guy. I mean, you, you just you, you can just see that with him. He just, he loves his systems. And they're great. Like, he, he really thinks these things out incredibly well. Um, I, so, that, that one's closer to a more traditional fantasy than Fonda is, but... It's still uniquely him. You can tell, you can feel that. Like he's putting something of himself really in there. Um, and those, and those are the books that really stand out today. It, I feel like without that authenticity, I really want to read that medieval fit book of yours. By the way, I really, really do. That sounds so cool. Um, but uh, it's one of those things. Like if, if it's not there, I think readers today will pick up on it a lot quicker. Right. Yes. All right. I yeah. could. Do you agree? Do you agree? Oh, yeah. yeah. Yeah, absolutely. I think it's, um, you know, when you really love something, that, that definitely comes through for the reader. And I think if you're just putting in the motions and it's just a job, then that comes through to you. So, yeah, it's it, it seems like for me, the secret is, um, you know, trying to find that, that balance of, you know, 
finding editors that you trust, that you can listen to, who will help you to make things better, um, but who don't want to take that spark away from your work as well. Um, and so far, I've been really lucky with that, that I, everyone I've worked with has really you know, appreciated what I was trying to do and got what I was trying to do and um, is just trying to help me make the book the best thing it can be. Um, so I've been really lucky that way. Well, it, I, I think I think the thing is too. Like a lot of people tend uh, like tend to think that the like the more traditional route wants to take away this thing. No, they don't. They really want to yeah. keep it. But what a lot of people don't really don't really think in those terms is they're serving their own masters as well. Yeah. And, and you have to keep that in mind when they, when they make whatever changes they're going to make. They're doing what they feel is best to make them money, but they don't necessarily want to destroy what what you have either it's more like we like this but we needs to fit certain things that we're looking yeah. for and sometimes and honestly it, it's if you're with the right people those compromises aren't the most terrible things in the world to fight yeah absolutely yeah i mean the thing, especially when you get into bigger publishers uh you know they have marketing departments and they have sales numbers to think about and uh yeah that's the business for sure yeah, so I mean, I, that's it. But I mean, so beyond all that, have you published on your own? Are you kind of going more towards, or are you just going to keep it as traditional, like traditional for as long as you can? Like, what are your goals at this point? Um, yeah, so far my plan is just traditional for the near future anyway. I always have this thing in the back of my mind that I would like to be hybrid at some point. Um, but I don't have any plans for independent publishing at the moment. So I've published, my first novel was with Cheezine, which is, um, you know, a decent sized, but, but small in global standards, a Canadian specific publisher. And then I had a couple of novellas with Tor.com Publishing, which is a branch of Macmillan. So it's, you know, big five, but it's a, a smaller, uh, you know, imprint, um, but they do wonderful books uh, and are really known for their novellas. Um, so, yeah, so, so far my only book publishing experience has been with those two publishers. And uh, definitely the plan for the next couple of things that I'm working on, on with my agent is to pursue, um, you know, to pursue traditional publishing with them. But if we got to a point where something wasn't a fit for traditional publishing or I just had a side project that I wanted to work on, I would absolutely consider doing it myself for sure. Yeah, well, and as for me, I'm like I'm I've done some traditional published stuff with, with the poetry about uh, that got published traditionally, but I'm trying to get into it with novels. But I I kind of look at it like a two pronged plan. I'm going to produce stuff now that I'm going to have fun with no matter what, and then I and then for me then the then the other part of that is um, I'm going to go for it with what I feel would fit a more traditional model. Now maybe I'm completely wrong. Maybe I, maybe 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 it'll it'll never work out traditionally, but I'm all okay with that too. I'm I'm at, I'm at that point now where I'm comfortable in my own skin, and I kind of know what I can and can't do, and I'm just gonna go for it. I just feel like that's that's the mentality that, that you need to have with this. Mm-hmm. So. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, because all you can control at the end of the day is what you're working on, what you're writing, you know, and uh, the business side of it. Um, can really really consume you and and can be really soul destroying um you know but it's out of your control for the most part uh, um, especially in traditional publishing so yeah i try to remind myself of that every day just to kind of you know tur- turn it off a little bit and and look inward and work on my stuff work on the next thing because um the decisions that other people make um for the most part once i've once i've delivered my part of it they're not something that i can change anyway well, well, there's that. I, I think, um, so I have like, I have my six rules of success. My rule four, I, saw, I call it the rest is rain. Uh, the idea is I can't control the rain, which yeah. is ironically going back to the beginning, I said, don't blame me if it gets really rainy. Um, but the, the reason I, I realized that is like, you can't, I, I've said, your job, your job, like the paradox of success is success, you can do everything right and still not succeed. The mm-hmm. paradox is, though, if you don't do those steps that make you successful, right, you can't succeed at all. That's the paradox, yeah. right? Yeah. So the only thing you can really control is you can put yourself into the best opportunities possible to be successful. And all you can do, all you can hope for is that enough people are interested in what you're doing that they follow you. Yeah. Uh, and sometimes 
accidents happen, but not all accidents are bad accidents. I won an I I found myself nominated for an Aurora and won it last year. I never planned that. Never yeah. thought never thought that would come the best. So I mean, like good things happen, right? Like I, so, I kind of look at it kind of like, okay, what can I control? What can I do? I can make as loud a noise as possible. I can just do the work in terms of my books. And I can give myself as many opportunities as possible to present them in front of an audience. Yeah. Beyond that, I can't do anything else. Yeah. Yeah, definitely. Yeah. So that's that's me getting that that that's what little wisdom I've learned in this life. So if it, if it, if somebody else does better than me, that's great. Honestly, I mean, we all work very hard at what we do. I can't yeah. really, I can't fault, I can't fault anybody else's further success, and maybe I don't, I don't see the success I need to see, and maybe it's time to do something different, and that's, but that's what you learn. I mean, that's, I mean, we learn from our failures, you know. So. Yeah, yeah, absolutely, and I feel too like our, our world, the science fiction and fantasy publishing, it feels, you know, very supportive. Uh, and very collegial, you know, for the most part. I mean, you know, we have our jerks like any community, but um, for the most part, I really do feel like we're all, you know, cheering each other on and um, happy for each other's successes as writers. And uh, that really helps, I think, for me, because, you know, things can go up and down in terms of the business, but knowing that um, you have writer friends who have your back, we believe in you, um, you know, is a great thing. And so I think, you know, that you hear sometimes about, uh, people in, in creative fields where where it's more of a, sort of a crab bucket where everyone's trying to pull the other person down and I'm happy to say that I haven't experienced too much of that so far so that's great Ariel if the if you ever get so are you ever going to do movies or television uh, not that I have any plans to do okay if you ever go down those roads because of the yeah. money involved that can happen I'm not going to say it always does but it can happen for sure um, if you ever go down those roads, um, just be, just be cautious there. Like, like keep your guard up. But beyond that, um, no, I mean, honestly, like, okay, this is my opinion. It takes great audacity to present your art to the world. Mm-hmm. And a good, and I'm not talking the program I'm recording. I'm just, just, it takes guts. You have to, be, you have to, you, you, how long did it take you to write your first novel that you got published? Just, I out of curiosity. <laughs> couple of years um yeah i'd say probably a couple of years uh, including revisions so you spent two years on something you believed in mm-hmm. because you wanted to present it to the world that's a lot of guts honestly that that is an incredible amount of guts mm-hmm. and so and you're present and that was i mean you've written other things since mm-hmm. and i'm sure that you might think they're better i don't you probably you hopefully you've progressed as a as as a writer and I think still hope everybody has, but it doesn't take away the fact that at that time, whenever you, when you published that book, that was the best you, you could have been at that time. Yeah. That takes a, that takes a really, really, really lot of guts. And again, I, and I want to read your book now. When I and if I when I do read your book, I may not like it, but it doesn't take or yeah. or maybe I'll love it. But either way, it doesn't take away from the fact that you went out there and you did it. And it, and even if it's not my cup of tea, you know what? You you did it. You found a voice. You found you found a home for it. You've done well. And honestly, you should be applauded for that. That's Thank that. You. Yeah, I, I think I think I think honestly, that's the that's the way it should be. And if one day you win a Hugo or a Nebula or maybe you get a number one New York Times bestseller, you know what? That because you work, you have put as you put said twenty years into. Yeah. Mastering your craft, you've done journalism, you've got probably have an incredible disciplinary system to get to where you're at because it, it's not easy to do that day in and day out. And so you look at that and yeah, you know, how can I not root for you? <laughs> yeah, no, it's true. It's really it's really great. It's uh it helps a lot of things. Yeah. Well that's that's just it. Like I, I like it's easy it's easy to look at the end result when you see it people that are successful but what a lot of people don't don't really think about is it's a journey to get to that point like and everybody's journey is a little different um some people some people like um look at i uh, look at like you know how some people may may have done it differently than you that doesn't change the fact that however they did it they paid prices like nobody 
you go to stand out in this world, right? You, right? You're not playing it safe. I mean, you're going to pay some prices. That's just that's just the way it is, um, yes. right? And yeah. so that's so you can't knock any. I don't knock anybody for any success, anything, anything they get, because most ninety five percent of the time, you earn it. Uh huh. Yeah. Oh yeah, absolutely. Yeah, and, and and you know, on the flip side of it, I think watching some of my friends who, you know, in my critique group and stuff, who have put in those hours as well, and seeing them have their first books out and and having success and awards nominations and all of that is is really, yeah, it's amazing. It's it's just makes me so proud and and happy to know them. So, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> that's, well, well, well. I mean, that I think that's the way we should. I I, I think that's the way people. I learned this. I've been learning this a little bit. I mean, one of the the, um, the downsides of being successful doing stuff is you do kind of pull yourself a little bit apart from everybody else. Not because you're better or anything like that, but you're successful. I think I think when you do hit those points, you build expectations for yourself, and other people have expectations on you. And it's kind of it's kind of a um, um, there's a bit of a divide that comes with that sometimes. So you want to see as many people as successful as possible because it encourages you to keep going. Because, I mean, if they can achieve that, maybe you can too. Or maybe, you know, and that's, and I think that's the, that's a, that's a great thing to hope for. I don't want anyone to fail. Um, I'd rather have everybody be successful and happy in what, in finding what they really want to do. Mm -hmm. Yeah, definitely. Yeah, I, I might I, maybe I'm an idealist, but whatever. I, I prefer this to the alternative. So, but anyway, uh, so we've done okay. So, you, so you've done you've done some novellas. What are you more comfortable with, like the novella form or like novel? Like, what do you prefer? Um, I think I'm a novelist at heart. Uh, novellas are really fun. I like writing that length because. Um, they don't really eat your life for two years the way that a novel can, uh, but they give you a little bit more room to play than a short story does. So it's a really fun length to write. Uh, but the ideas that I tend to get tend to be novel length ideas, and um, the novel is just the form of art that I've always loved the most. So I think novels are my first love, but I could definitely see writing another novella at some point too. That's cool. Uh, all right, so we, we're talking about your science fiction fantasy. So I named yep. a few authors. Who 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 do you love? Oh, favorite authors these days. Uh, well, you mentioned Fonda Lee. I think Fonda Lee is fantastic. Um, you know, she's just and she's such a writer's writer in a way. You know, she, I mean, she's uh, I, it's a fun to I, read anyway. But she's just, cool. You know, watching what she does on the page is amazing. Yeah, she's she's fun to meet in person. I actually did a panel with her at When Words Collide. That's how I met her. I was oh, like, cool. yeah, no, I, I it was her, Adam Dries, a, a musician, novelist, and Del Suelo, and I'm, I'm looking at this panel I'm like, what am I doing here? But uh, <laughs> but uh, um, no, she is super fun. She's a really really cool person. I I really uh, when uh, she won when we won the the night we won the Auroras, it was cool because I was like I couldn't believe the amount of congrats I was getting, and it's like wow, I'm getting congratulated by a wow like world best selling like very cool person. She's amazing. Um, yeah, yeah. Yeah. yeah, she's great, and um, I really love uh, everything Robert Jackson Bennett writes. Um, is fantastic. Uh, I have not read him. What does he do? Oh, he's so good. Yeah, um, he had the the series that began with City of Stairs was how I I encountered his work, and that whole series. There's three books, and and they're really fantastic. Uh, and then his latest one out, latest novel this year was Foundry Side. Okay. Which is a really cool uh, secondary world fantasy. He's also got a novella out recently that I haven't read yet as well. So something to look forward to there. Um, yeah, who are some of the other ones that I'm reading these days? Um, someone, uh, well, you know, speaking of novellas, I really loved um, P. Jelly Clark's uh, novella, The Black God's Drums, uh, which was, I got to be on the same novella ballot as that book this year at the nebulas and i was just honored to be on the ballot because it was uh it's an amazing novel uh sort of uh sort of steampunky set in kind of alternate new orleans and um that sounds super cool that sounds really cool actually yeah i really 
really cool. Yeah, the Black God's Drums is what it's called, and it's it's a really short read, even for a novella. It, it was very quick. I think I read it on a train ride, and uh, you know, I wasn't even all the way from Toronto to Ottawa when I finished it. But it was um, just uh, oh. awesome. That sounds like it sounds like that's it. I want more, which is the perfect yeah. thing you want with a novella. Um, exactly. Yeah. Okay. Uh, I mentioned Sanderson fondly. The other, one, I, I, I actually so right so right now I'm actually reading the other person I'm reading a lot right now is Jay Kristoff and Amy Coffin. Their their series is, I just okay. lo- I love the design of those books. I really really love them because they don't come they're not traditional in the sense that like you'll read a book and 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 the page is designed to create a mood as much as the words are. And I I really really the one thing I kind of wish um, science fiction books in general i wish they were a little bit more experimental like that because i i do feel the one thing about um science fiction in particular is this is the this is the books of the future kind of deal like this the, these are the books about what if in the future and there are i feel i still feel we have a lot more possibilities today with what media what we can do with mediums today because they're a lot closer together all of them and I yeah. feel like the one genre in fiction that should be playing with this a lot more is science fiction. And I feel like it's still, it's more traditional than it should be. And I know that sounds like really weird on the one hand, but on the other hand, I'm like, it, well, everything's changing. And I feel like if there's any genre that should be exploring those changes the most, it would be science fiction. Yeah, that's really interesting. I hadn't thought about that, but it's really true that you don't see a lot of innovation in interior design of books, at least not that I am aware of. Yeah, well, that's the one thing about young adult style books. I really, that's the one thing about young adult I really dig is they will take chances like that sometimes, and sometimes it doesn't work. But it's you know what, honestly, it's okay to like. We don't give ourselves, I think, enough permit. I, I, I have, like, my, my first draft. I have, like, I handwrite it. I handwrite my first draft in notebooks. I make all of the messes. I let myself make as many messes. I still remember back in, like, kindergarten. Do you remember, Did you ever do the kindergarten one where you took a marble and you dipped it in paint and you rolled it all on the page? No, but that sounds like fun. It, it is super. No, it's super fun. Yeah. Every, every uh, marble art you do, right, is different. Because again, every marble is different, right? Yeah. So, but the thing is, there, there's those. I, I always feel like like the first draft in particular should be one of those things where you make as many messes as you mind. It doesn't even have to make sense right here fully, right? Write some notes, work on it, but later, like when you get to like like when I get to go to type it up, then I take what what I feel is like okay, this doesn't work, this doesn't work, this doesn't work. That's when I give myself like okay, it's time to cut. But that first draft, I let myself make so many messes, and because it's like, I, I I always I always think of it like this: chocolate chip cookies was an accident. So uh-huh. someone accidentally put chocolate chips in cookie dough, and uh-huh. it was wonderful, right? So sometimes the accents go the other way, uh-huh. but sometimes but sometimes those accents are chocolate chip cookies, like hidden uh, in, like in the dough. So I give myself permission to seek those out, and in that first draft. And going back to, like, the science fiction thing, like, we, again, if we're into the future, we're into, like, the more forward-thinking stuff, the, 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 like I say, young adult lets themselves go for it, and sometimes you see, like, uh, Muse of Fire has, does stuff in scores, which I think is really cool. Um, again, just playing with the mediums, merging them together in a really, really, really fun way. And I, I feel like science fiction in particular would benefit from it being a little bit more chancy like that. That's just maybe me. Yeah, that's that's really interesting. I hadn't really thought about it before, but I absolutely agree. And I love when when I do come across, um, you know, even just a really beautiful font uh, or something like that uh, can make such a difference. Yeah, well, I, I'm 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 not allowed to just look for fonts on my computer. I'm not mature enough. I'm not mature enough. <laughs> There's like I used to do design. Like I don't know. If I, like you might like especially so. Back in the days when Quark's Express was still the the big thing with with newspapers and things like that, we would uh, we would occasionally look for fonts. So there's this site called thefonts.com. There's like these thousands of fonts that you can get lost in that. It's like so distracting. There's so so many pretty fonts, and then, yeah. right. So I'm not mature enough. I'm still not mature enough for Netflix either. Maybe one day, one day, <laughs> one day. <laughs> but. Uh, Hey, hey, at least I hey, I acknowledge my own immaturities. I think that's that is somewhat mature, right? So it's a, it's a step, yeah. It's a step, right? It's like I can't handle this. 
And uh, I, I will, so I don't. And one, yeah. m- maybe one day when I'm old enough, I will finally be able to do it. So, <laughs> but Kate, it sounds like like you're doing very awesome for yourself, and that's all, and and that honestly, thanks for coming. Oh, thank you. Yeah, it's great. Yeah. So uh, I think we have a good interview here. What do you think? Yeah, that sounds that sounds good to me. Is there anything else that you wanted to chat about? Oh, there's there's. And theory lots. Um, <laughs> uh, how much time you got? <laughs> right. Oh, uh, yeah, we can keep going for a while. Yeah. Uh, okay, you want to keep going for a while? Okay, so. Uh, all right. So you like like we were talk we were talking like books. We were talking books. How about okay? So. So for you, when you started journalism, was it because you want? Did you always want to write fiction even then? And did you think like need to learn skills, or was there something about journalism that just drew you into it initially when you did it? Um, I think I always had this feeling like I needed a, a backup career, uh, and I don't even know if I really even put it in those terms in my own head. But I think it was just an unspoken assumption that I couldn't, I couldn't just do fiction. Um, and looking back now. I don't know whether I would have advised myself that way or not. You know, I mean, maybe it would have been better to take for live really cheap and work on fiction. Um, but that wasn't even a possibility that I considered at the time. I just, I figured I had to, I had to go to school and I had to have a, a career that would pay me money. And um, originally I was going to be a lawyer. And then about halfway through undergrad, I decided that uh, journalism was a better choice for me. And I knew that I'd always liked writing and I liked ideas and um, I was studying political science at the time. Uh, So it just seemed like a good fit uh, in a number of ways. And I ended up going and doing a master's degree in journalism at Carleton, uh, which was really great. And I still teach in that department now, 20 years later. So, uh, yeah, it was was a fantastic... uh, uh, you know, learn the craft, and definitely a lot of the same things that I was I was doing with nonfiction are my concerns with fiction as well. So I'm very interested in social change and political systems and history, uh, and the way that people interact with each other, you know, on the small scale and then the bigger scale. And so you know, you can examine those things using nonfiction or fiction, really. Well, okay, that's. I actually, you know, it's interesting because I've interviewed Kelly Armstrong, I've interviewed uh, Fonda Lee, I've interviewed a few people that have gotten really, really high up into the fiction realm. And one of the things I've noticed about all of you is the discipline you have. Like, you guys have an incredible amount of discipline and the ability just to handle the task you have. And I always, um, I, t- I mentioned this with, with Fonda, and I mentioned this a little bit with Kelly too. It's almost like your outside career trains you for fiction. Uh huh. Definitely. I think there's a lot that I've learned from journalism that helps me when it comes to fiction. I mean, even just things like uh, having a deadline and working with an editor. You know, as you know, it's uh, it can be really helpful to have that kind of structure and that. Uh, and so that now, when I'm writing fiction, it doesn't it doesn't make me panic knowing that I've got to have something done by a certain day or or work with an editor, um, you know, so I think all that is really good discipline and, uh, and also not being too precious about your own prose, you know, I mean, I, I, I really believe in beautiful sentences and I really love to, to make my words shine as much as possible. But if I work with an editor and they want to move a comma or something, I do not tend to be the writer oh, who oh, will oh, fight oh, against oh, that. Oh, oh I, I, I don't either. Like both those mistakes, I like, sometimes I'll read them and I'll go, Really? Like I, I, I am like like that doesn't doesn't seem that different, yeah. but okay, sure, whatever, yeah. right? I'm not I'm not gonna argue that those points because those, those I'm more interested in getting my to tell the best story I can possibly tell, right? Yeah. Sometimes my editor's right, and I'm like for I'll give you an example. So my novel coming up, I have a unicorn that parts rainbows that literally talked in wingdings, right? Right. She, yeah, yeah. yeah I, 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 I almost, I almost hear you trying not to laugh there on that one, right? Or, was, cring, or cringing, one or the other. I'm not sure. But no, I was, I was smiling with joy. Yeah, <laughs> but my editor goes, I don't know if that would work in terms of fonts. But I was, right. I'm like, I might want to keep it. I read what she wrote, how she described it. I'm like, that's actually pretty damn good. 
damn, <laughs> damn it, yeah. right? And it's like it's actually better than it's actually almost better than the wing dings because she's. I again, this is something I'm learning. I'm not. I'm not going to pretend that I'm anywhere near on the on the level some of, some of you guys are at. But one of the things I've learned about like storytelling is it's all nuance. It's not about yeah. necessarily what you show. It's what you don't show that you imply, and that's the stuff that really really resonates because it's like, oh, there's layers to this. It's like, yeah, there's layers yeah. to this, and the way she did that was like. Damn it! It's actually better, better than I have. Like, I, if I do a book three, I actually have his his uh, descendants talking in emojis. Ah, uh, neat. <laughs> yeah, evolu- showing evolution in a very very interesting way, right? And uh, I thought that would be a good way to use the descriptive there, but she did such a good job here. I'm not sure I can really. It's like he did it better. Crap, <laughs> you know. Yeah. Yeah, well, that's what they're for. Yeah, yeah. have an editor who, who does that. It's a, a wonderful feeling for sure. Oh, oh no, she's great. Like, uh, and I, I, I and I'm going to just advertise her here. Ellen Michelle, you're awesome. And um, enough said. But it's one of those things where you just you you, you recognize like it's not. I'm going to take a beating sometimes with my ego. It's just that that, that I have to because not every not every idea I have is going to be a good one. Mm-hmm. Right, right, and and you have to recognize. You have to recognize when they're terrible, or sometimes you recognize after the fact that they're terrible. Um, but on the same token, right, it's about telling the best story you possibly can, however yeah. you can do it. And that also means that sometimes those really, really awesome sentences you're proud of, they don't serve the story. They just don't. Yeah. So- yeah, absolutely. Yeah. So I think it's it's learning, you know, sometimes you've got to be ready to push back when there's something that the editor is not quite getting about what you your vision for the story, you know? Um, but for the most part, yeah, I think listening to your editor and to putting your ego on the shelf as much as possible is the best way for sure. Well, yeah, you're going to make those mistakes, I think, once or twice. Like, there's, uh, But you, you learn, you learn it's okay to scream, just just, just go <laughs> scream first and then okay. come back because it's not, it's not personal. It's just, it's not personal. It, and I think that's the, yeah. that's the one of the hardest things because you again, going back to what I said earlier, you put yourself a lot of yourself into everything you do in terms of in terms of creating, and it's hard to separate yourself. But that's also kind of why you need an editor because it's so hard to separate yourself. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. So, but there's that. Um, let's see. Um, so what do you feel um, of, of the books so far? I mean, I I really want to I really want to really talk about, like that me- that medieval fantasy just sounds awesome. So, what was it that, okay, so we, we mentioned this uh, we, vaguely, so what was it that made it different from all the other stuff that you, like, the traditional fantasy that broke through? Like, what, what was it that you wanted to say there? Um, I really wanted to write a kind of deeply medieval book in a way that I hadn't seen before, which is a weird thing to say because it feels like so much of our fantasy is inspired by the European Middle Ages, but, um... There's actually not a whole lot that's really based in the ordinary lives of people living in Europe in the 14th century, which is what I was was writing about. And you know, so there's no castles or knights or or uh, dragons or anything like that. And so it, it really draws more on uh, the kind of monsters that you see in the margins of medieval manuscripts and and uh, kind of uh, this. On the one hand, it's very wild and very weird, uh, but on the other hand, it's also very grounded in uh, ordinary life, uh, and it's very centered on the lives of women. Um, so, I think those were some things that I just felt like I wanted to explore, uh, and I don't know if I really consciously thought about how it differed from other books that were out there at the time, but it just it just really fascinated me, and you know. So I think that's usually when you know you've got something is when you have something that fascinates you and you just you, your brain is working on it even when you're driving or on the bus or whatever and you know then you know you're off to the races. Well, I I think the thing about that that's really interesting is so I did a essay called the Modern Day Percival uh, way back for well a long time ago for Ben Bella Books and compared uh, Aragon to Percival. Mm-hmm. So I actually had to read the original I read the original Percival manuscript right I actually I I bought it and I read it and. Yeah, that's pretty much the basis of a lot of our fiction, not just fantasy, but a lot of it. 
Uh, and the reason why I think the medieval stuff's romanticized so much is that book in particular. Because yeah. it talks about the knights and the quests and all that other wonderful fun stuff. So it makes sense that when we see a lot of our modern fantasy, yeah, it's going to focus on a lot of the same stuff because that's the, like, that was considered the romantic stuff even back in that back in that time. It's, right. Right, right? You're yeah. not, you, you went at it from... I'm not going to say a not necessarily a non-romantic point of view, but you didn't yeah. you didn't follow the romantic formula at all. You said, you know what, real like real, it's almost like you did an, an urban an urban fantasy. You almost like, like almost like an urban fantasy kind of sort of, except except it's not it's a it's from the medieval time. Yeah. Right, and you got and you got rid of a lot of. And it's like none of the romantic crap. It's yeah. through, we're, we're gonna we're gonna see what like what it. That's actually very bold. Yeah, yeah, and I don't think I realized until later yeah. how how different it was when I went looking for comp titles. You know, I mean, it's hard, it's hard to find. Um, you know, Jesse Bullington has uh, some novels that are similar in in their setting. Um, you know, it's not completely unheard of, but it it was it is a different way of approaching the European. Oh, totally. Middle Ages than we see in fantasy novels a fair bit. Yeah. Yeah. So, and, and, but I thought it was really fun. And one of the gratifying things about it is that a lot of readers feedback has been about that in a really positive way, you know, saying that they, they haven't read a book quite like this before and, uh, that it, it felt deeply medieval to them in a way that, um, you know, that a lot of other sort of pseudo medieval books don't. And, you know, and I have, I have nothing against a, a more pseudo medieval approach. I mean, like you say, it, it, that's part of our heritage too, and it's evolved that way for a reason. And I think it can be lots of fun. Um, but, uh, but it was nice to see that the readers were kind of hungry and interested in this approach that I took as well. Um, so that's been one of the the gratifying things about it for sure yeah so okay here's so here's the other thing then typically fantasy and even science fiction series tend to have like there tend to be series so are you, yeah. do you have like a series in your head that you kind of want to do not really i wrote it as a standalone and uh sold it as a standalone so there's nothing in the works um there is actually there's a, a prequel short story that is supposed to come out in an anthology um later this year in an anthology called Trouble the Waters. Um, so that's, and that's about my main character when she was a child. So um, it's connected, but it's not, you know, a series, really. Um, I do have an idea for a novella or something that I would write to go with it, but I have not even started to think about when I would put that on my to-do list, so. <laughs> no, 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 it's fair. No, 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 that's fair. I, how about, like, a, like a different world, different place, different, like, time? The reason I'm bringing this up is usually, like, when you talk science fiction and fantasy, you look at, like, fantasy. Like, there's the Wheel of Time, there's there's uh, yeah. Stormlight Archive, there's even the Jade, even the Jade Seal. Like, there's, there's usually, like, they usually come in threes, right? Yeah. Right? And, uh, I mean, it, it sounds and to I've me like... Yeah, yeah, I've never done that. Yeah, yeah. No. Yeah, it's it's funny. I mean, partly I think it's because um, when I when I was sort of starting to break in, I had you know, like I said, I had a few novels that never went anywhere, and so I was kind of used to the idea that well, I'll write standalones and then see because you don't want to write an entire series if you're going for traditional publishing, you don't want to write an entire series and then and then not sell the first one. You know, you have to then you have to think, okay, what am I going to do with this thing? Um, so, given that I was focusing on getting it got in that and so that's what I've always done except for I do have the uh, two novellas that are a duology uh, with Tor.com but um, other than that I haven't done a series at all so that is unusual for sure well so you're you're, you're almost like the the uh, more I, I guess serious Ailey Martinez Ailey Martinez when he writes stuff it's it's always one and done Right. Yeah. And yeah. there's nothing wrong with that, actually. I, I like the fact that every time I read something from him, it's different. Right. Yeah. There's there and and you know what? There's nothing wrong. That's the that's the path you want to walk. Is there any other genres you kind of want to get into, or are you happy in, in that realm? Um, I, most of my ideas so far seem to be kind of historical fantasy uh, or time travel. Um. So I'm working on a couple of things now that are historical fantasy. Um. Uh, and I've also written, uh, I had one game, uh, like interactive fiction that came out with Choice of Games last year, which was historical 
as well, and I've got another one in the works for them that's historical fantasy. So that seems to be where I keep landing, and it's not really even a conscious thing. It's just sort of every idea I have, that's that's what it is, you know? Yeah. Um, so, uh, yeah, one of these days I'll have to, you know, my agent is always just sort of like, yeah, whatever you want to write, just <laughs> go for it. And historical fantasy seems to be one of those subgenres that, like, it's never, it's never really the big hot thing, but it's also never the bust either. It hasn't done the thing that, um, you know, for example, uh, you know, urban fantasy seems to get really hot and then it's not, and then it's hot again. And, uh, historical fantasy seems to be a little bit more steady. So, um, so it seems to be a fairly safe bet that way. Who knows? Well, well, as safe as anything is these days, exactly. right? Right. There's, I, I, I don't necessarily believe in, sa- in, in the concept of safety, quote unquote. Although it does lead to an interesting question. It's like all your historical stuff. Is Absolutely. it the same period or are they different periods? Different periods. Uh, yeah. So I have another book coming out with Cheezine next year called The Humors of Grub Street. And that'll be in spring 2020. And that one is 18th century London. Okay. Uh, the first one, the armed in our fashion, was 14th century Flanders. Uh, so yeah, so they're they're both European, uh, but different centuries and different countries. Okay, so I, I'll ask this. I'll ask this then because I do have my own favorite periods in history. But yeah. what what draws you back to those particular points in history? Because usually there's like a personal interest in them somehow, some way. I always find so. Yeah, yeah, I seem to be drawn. It seems I was just thinking about this actually. That there seems to be three periods in European history that keep drawing me back, um, and I think it's because they're they're times of transition um, politically that um, you know I'm really interested in political science, and so I think that that's probably why. Uh, one of them is the 18th century, and obviously because it's a time of revolution and uh, the Enlightenment and technological change. Um, and the 14th century, you know, for much the same reason, you know, you had peasants revolts and um, the, the feudal system was was in crisis and, um, you know, a lot of things were changing at that time. And I just started working on uh, a new book that it's so new, I can't, I don't, you know, I don't really have it pinned down yet, but it's it's in the, the end of the Roman Empire. So the barbarian migrations uh, period, which is, again, is kind of a really big transitional period um and i keep returning to europe i think because you know that's that's my own heritage like where my parents come from and and uh and it's the history that i know best so even though i have a lot of short stories set in canada whenever i get a novel idea it seems to be in europe so no no, just, no, no, no. And, that, and that's cool like for me for me my favorite periods are ancient greek the yeah. renaissance and the yeah. 1930s Ooh, nice so, yeah. and, you know what they all have in common uh, what was it? What was the middle one? The Renaissance, ancient yeah. Greece, and the 1930s. Um, I don't know. They all uh, those particular points in time. That was when new ideas and concepts were being explored into civilization. When you go to ancient Greece, you're talking to like the yep. classic teachers. They were looking at the nature of the world. They thought the world was then. To go yep. to the Renaissance. The Renaissance, the printing press had just come out. And yep. uh, and but as a result, people were communicating in ways they never had before, and so new ideas were just being. Con- there was an exponential yep. growth of ideas, literature, all that stuff. Now, if you look at the 1930s, that was true as well. Like that was a point in history right before yep. World War II, where the Great Depression happened, and people were looking for solutions to problems. And I and then for me, like I look yep. at today in particular, we're in a we're similarly in that boat today. The internet has made it possible. Like, look, I'm yeah. having a conversation with you. We are literally two thousand miles apart, right? Or two, yeah. right? We are far, far apart, but we're having a regular conversation. We've talked about books, passion, history, literature. Like, we've had a really cool conversation. This would not have been possible even ten years ago, right? Yeah. Like as is. Yeah. But but if you look at if you if you take the time to really look, you don't look at just the news and political whatever. You're seeing that people are being very innovative worldwide. Uh, yeah. I saw I saw uh, something about how in Ireland right now they're working on a way of growing food in mass using the ocean. It was brilliant. I've seen stuff like papercrete using paper as co- like concrete. We're trying all kinds of different things to solve problems that we're facing today. And I look at all three of those periods in history 
that way. Like, how did they deal with the insurmountable obstacles of those eras? How did they try? Like, right. I, I, like those. I thought those were points in history where we were at our boldest, if that makes sense. Uh-huh. So that that yeah, absolutely yeah. So those are the yeah. those are the those are the periods that fascinate me, right? In particular, yeah. um, but that but I mean, if you look at history in general, I mean, it's almost about it. I mean, depending on what era you go into, it actually doesn't even matter. Uh, it's about us overcoming, like trying to solve problems, and that we seem to sometimes still are solving even today. And you can learn a lot about your about the past, looking at the past. So. Yeah, definitely. Yeah, and sometimes you don't realize what it is that's that's connecting the things that draw you until afterwards. You know, things that things attract you, your attention for whatever reason, and then you can sort of see the patterns after a while. Yeah, and and sometimes you look at today and you're terrified. <laughs> and sometimes you look at today. Yeah, and, yeah. Sometimes, sometimes, but that's you can, funny. but you also can look at today and be hopeful too. That's the other thing too. I think I think um, what history has taught me is that there are points in time that, you know, good things are happening and bad things happen. And, Mm -hmm. but no matter what, life goes on. And Mm -hmm. you can overcome and you can, if as long as you're still here, you can still, like, like, there's hope. And there's, and things will inevitably change. Mm -hmm. Yeah, definitely. Yeah. That's the, you know, sometimes things get bad, but, (laughs) well, yeah, there's, there's a, yeah, I think there's there's always people who are working to make things better, and you can't always see it until you take a step back. So, well, yeah. the, the, the beauty about like, okay, I, I get to interview people like yourself all the time. There's lots of people doing incredible things all mm-hmm. the time. I, I like the one thing I get out of this podcast more than anything else is I'm always reminded of that. And whether it's producing yeah. a great book, whether it's um, I've a, a great album for music or illustrations or People are constantly going out there and just saying, "Here I am to the world" in a myriad of ways. Um, yeah. I find I find that the best strategy. I, f- I find if you really want to see that, ignore what I find this. Ignore your social media. <laughs> just yeah. just ignore ignore your social media in terms of anything political. I'm not saying you shouldn't be aware of what's going on. I'm just saying there's a um, you there. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Definitely. Yeah. Yeah. I, I, I just yeah. curious what the heck that was. <laughs> sound weird. <laughs> weird sound was coming out of the machine. But like we li- we live in a we live in an era where um, it's easy to see the negativity, but if you really want to look and know mm-hmm. if right, there are there are so many people doing so many incredible things every day against instrument sometimes like unbearable odds, and not, yeah. and not just here everywhere. And and I don't know, like maybe maybe I'm maybe I'm a romantic, but I I see that as a positive because I, I, that means that no matter what's going on around us now, it won't last. Yeah, yeah, definitely. Yeah, change is the only constant, you know, and that is something that you learn by looking at historical periods for sure. Absolutely. Well, I think though now, Miss Kate, I think we, I think, I think, it, unfortunately for me, it is time for me to go. Yeah. But but yeah. but that all said, it was awesome to really chat with you. It really really yeah. was. So why don't yeah, we... a, a nice hopeful note to end on. Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. So why don't we do this? Um, what is coming up for you next, mm-hmm. and how people can find you? If something just came out, promote that yeah. too. Okay. All right. Uh, yeah. So the next thing for me. Uh, my next book is The Humors of Cross Street, uh, which comes out uh, in spring. Um, but that's a little while from now, so um, if people want to find uh, my most recent book is Alice Payne Rides, which is the sequel to Alice Payne Arrives, uh, which are two time travel novellas about a highway woman who um, finds herself caught up in a history war. And uh, between two rival factions of time travelers. Uh, so they're lots of fun, um, very fast paced, quick books. Uh, and they're available in audio ebook and paperback. Um, and, uh, I mentioned armed in her fashion, which is, um, my medieval novel, which is out from Cheezine and it just came out last year. Um, and you can also find my, 
um, games on the Choice of Games website. Uh, and places you can find me are on Twitter. I'm Kate Hartfield on Twitter. And my website is katehartfield.com or hartfieldfiction.com. Both of them will find the website. Awesome. And that was my conversation with Kate Hartfield. It was definitely a fun one. I, uh, I learned an awful lot, actually. Um, like I said, very cool stuff. I'm going to be picking up her fantasy series. I suggest you guys do so as well. Um, so, thank Kate, thanks very much for coming on my show. You're welcome back anytime. I'm just going to get right to the end here because, uh, honestly, when we're collided, it's upon me, and i got to get ready for that and do it right. So... Thanks for listening, guys. If you want to support the podcast, you can do so in a number of different ways. My sponsors, Indie Imprint, definitely if you're a writer, creator, musician, video gamer, whatever the case may be, they will help you in design, promotion, everything along those lines. Indie Imprint is a great company for the independent creator, whoever you are. Uh, come see me at One Wars Collide. I'll be doing uh, some cool panels if you're a guest. Uh, I'll be doing a Dr. Seuss off 4 p.m. I'll be doing... On Saturday, I'll be doing a my live episode, a Just Joshing episode 300, When Words Collide, Jasper Room, 1 p.m. Saturday, there will be cake. I promise. Uh, I'm also going to be a guest on Go Indie Now, Joe Compton, 7 p.m. Friday night. So come see me there. I'm doing a podcast panel 9 p.m. Friday night as well. And otherwise, I'll be hanging around having a good time. So definitely check me out there. Uh, support the podcast through iTunes, Google Play, Spotify, Podomatic. You can find me on YouTube as Joshua Pentelaresco. My Facebook and Instagram is at J Pentelaresco. My Facebook page is Joshua Pentelaresco Author Podcaster. Support any or all of these as you see fit. Share, leave comments, whatever, or say nothing. Thanks very much for listening. Anyway, I appreciate you taking the time in your day to let me into your world. Beyond all that, stay inspired. Follow the eight rules. Have yourself an awesome weekend. And remember, the next episode will be airing Tuesday. Josh. Josh.